Hello everyone, welcome to another Product School Fireside Chat. I am very excited to be joined today by Basil, who is the CEO and co-founder at User Interviews. Basil, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me and I'm excited. So, uh, I'd love to just dive right in. Um, I would love to know more about your personal story. Uh, how did you get started in the tech industry? Yeah, definitely. Um, so when I was a senior in college, I interned at a startup. Um, it was, I, I was at Duke in Durham, North Carolina, and there was a small company there. It was one of the first ones in the area to raise money. And I just remember it being very exciting and fast moving and uh, like a really good culture and community. Um, so I always had the idea like, oh, this would be something that'd be fun to work on again in the future. And then I worked in consulting for a year and then I actually went to law school. Um, and then when I was in law school, my co-founders and I started a, a completely different company that was a kind of a failure. And then out of that, we've kind of pivoted and turned into user interviews. So I uh, definitely took a bit of a scenic route uh, to starting user interviews. But I think from early on, I was interested in tech. It's one of those interesting things how so many so many successful founders have experienced failure early on. Um, was there anything that was like your main takeaway from having something that failed that helped you make your next project successful? Yeah, I mean, very meta because uh, the company is user interviews. So we, you know, our current company is user interviews, which really helps people find users and talk to users and do user research. Um, so in a very meta perspective, that first company, uh, we didn't do any user research. We didn't talk to customers. I think that's part of the reason that it failed. So as we were trying to save that company or pivot, we started doing all of that user research and became really passionate about it. So uh, yeah, number one takeaway is stay close to your customers and our potential customers and really try to understand what their pain points are. Don't imagine that you know all the answers and that if you don't talk to them, you can just build it and then they'll come. That's just not the way it works. <laughs> yeah, it's that's so interesting how you like, you became successful by filling the need that you had in your first company. Yeah, so that's so meta, so interesting. Yeah. Um, so we, well, you've already started touching on this a little bit. What is the main problem that you're trying to solve? Or rather, why is it such a big problem that these companies that need to be user focused just mm -hmm. aren't getting in touch with their users? Yeah, in some ways, the problem is almost uh, too simple, right? We think that Every company is trying to understand their users. I think everyone agrees on that. And I think that you know everyone knows one of the best ways to understand any person, whether it's a potential client or a friend, is to talk to them and listen to them. But um, historically, when you kind of look at the space, it's just taken a really, really long time. And there's been a lot of friction uh, to finding these users and talking to them. Um, it's not easy to just, you can't just raise your hand and 10 people will be coming into your office. So we believe that you know, the values there and most people understand the value and the desire is there, but there's just been a lot of friction. So that's what we're trying to do is take away the, the time, take away the friction and make it super easy to talk to users or prospective users. Mm -hmm. And how do you see the, the user research industry is having changed over the most recent years? Because it seems like there's been like a real uptick in uh, people adopting it as like a thing they desperately need to do. Yeah, no, definitely. We, we've seen a massive change. Um, just like one aside, what we do, just in case people don't know, is we focus on finding users for user research studies, any type of research study. Um, the big split there is if a company wants to talk to non-users or existing users, and we have products for both, one that recruits non-users and one that manages reaching out to existing users. So with that product, we basically work with companies doing all sorts of research. Um, and over that time, we, we've kind of had front row seats to see kind of the industry change. Um, so when we first started, uh, companies didn't really have a lot of researchers. They would outsource it or kind of other people in the company would try to talk to users when it was convenient for them. Um, we then started seeing kind of this, uh, this in-housing of research. So there was a lot of content. There were a lot of people talking about being the first researcher. And then once they were in the companies, how do we ev evangel ah, evangelize the value of research and make it so that uh, people realize we're here and that we can be valuable. So there was a lot of talk in the community about that. Um, over the next few years, I guess all that evangelism worked because there's just been huge explosions in the size of these research teams. Um, and now all these researchers are trying to figure out, hey, how do we prioritize research? We're getting way too many asks. Everyone's tr everyone wants research for every decision they're making, which I think is awesome, obviously. Um, so that, that's really what we've seen. It's like initially we're bringing research in-house then once it became in-house and once there's been more tools to help decrease the friction uh the demand for the research has just skyrocketed 
And so to, to build this solution that, that is mm -hmm. obviously so necessary, um, mm -hmm. how are your product and engineering teams organized? Like, how do you fix that problem? Yeah, it, it's definitely a, uh, a, we're definitely kind of constantly iterating because we've been growing fast as an organization. So when you have two engineers versus when you have 20, it's just different. And I'm sure as we continue to scale up, there'll be more changes. But uh, right now we use a, a pod structure um, where there are five engineers on the pod. So one tech lead and two squads, which are pairs of engineers. Then each one of those has a product, uh, a product manager and a product designer. Uh, and we found that kind of this size of five and kind of having people work on one problem in an iterative way over a long period of time uh, has really been good because then the whole team gets close to those problems and they uh, they get close to the users and they, they know how to work together well. And how often do you drink your own champagne and do your own user research with your own user research tools? Yeah, we, we definitely do a lot of, uh, you know, dog fooding the product. So we... Uh, we we do research all the time. Our product team uh, likes to do kind of continuous discovery, and we, we're actually really excited. We just brought in our first uh, VP of user research, so she's really helping to look across the company, figure out what decisions need to be made, and uh, when we should use user research, and, and how user research can help that. Because you know we think of user research as a tool that just helps you make better decisions. So uh, so we do it a lot. We use our own product a lot. Yeah, that, that's quite a meta role for her, where she's like the VP of user research at a user research company. That must be quite the head spinner at uh, dinner parties. Yeah, to explain. Exactly. she's like a user researcher doing user research with user researchers about user interviews. So it's, there's a lot of uh, a lot of meta uh, which I think also makes it fun. Yeah, yeah, it's the kind of like the, the whimsy of the job, I guess. Yeah, and, and uh, I think it's fun for the the clients too that we're doing the research with because uh, they're used to being on the other side of the table, right? They're used to the, being the one asking questions. Um, I remember one time very early on when I just started and was doing research, uh, I was like doing research with the, the head of this fast growing start, uh, startup or the head of research of this fast growing startup. And at the end, she was like, okay, all of your questions had bias. You did all of this wrong. We're gonna like redo your whole script. So I like, I went through the research session that she basically just coached me on it. So I think it's fun for, for them to, yeah, amazing. Um, so this this month at Product School, we're focusing on leadership and what it takes to be a good leader, um, mm -hmm. how you can sort of achieve that next level of authority, how it changes mm -hmm. your perspective, all that good stuff. Uh, so you've got sort of the main title of CEO as well as co-founder. Um, what does it mean to you to be a CEO? Because I feel like it's quite a it's quite a weighty title with a lot of like expectations and a lot of like maybe misconceptions about it. So what does it mean for you? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I was me and my co-founders. We were all relatively young when we started this, so we don't have it so much. Hey, what does it mean to not be a co-founder? We don't have the same amount of experience that most people do. But I think probably the major thing is you realize, you know, if there's a problem or something not working, like you have to, you can't just not think about it and assume someone else will fix it. Like it's important for you to kind of bubble those things up to the top. Um, when I think about kind of like what a CEO does, you know, there's a few different responsibilities. You know, first is kind of like setting strategy and vision, uh, obviously hiring and recruiting a great team and then managing the team that you've uh, hired and is on the team. Um, helping the fundraise, obviously, if you're a venture back company, it takes a lot of time and the bigger you get, the more amount of your time is talking to investors and fundraising and managing those relationships. And then um, you also wanna communicate out the vision and strategy uh, that you've helped build and you wanna make sure that you're visible to clients and partners. So a lot of communication, a lot of you know quick decisions um, and you're communicating with a lot of different stakeholders and a lot of different people within the company. So you kind of have a unique view uh, there. Mm -hmm. What's the most fun part of the job for you? What's the bit you enjoy the most? Um, I really like, um, when, you know, there's someone that you're really excited about, uh, and they decide to join the team that that's obviously great. And then once they're on the team, you know, watching them succeed, being able to see them move up or gather new responsibilities, um, that's fun. And, and I do like kind of the more, you know, digging into the data probably a little bit more than most CEOs and trying to come up with different insights or different strategies and then, Kind of the final thing is obviously like just getting positive feedback from customers and the people that are actually using the product is always always feels great. Mm -hmm, definitely, I can definitely imagine that. Um, so, what would you say are the most important skills specifically for a CEO to have? Yeah, I think um, 
you you definitely need to be a good communicator and that's something you know I'm trying to constantly work on and become better at um, and that's good in both um, the way you communicate but also realizing the cadence and how often you should communicate and the different channels you should co uh, communicate uh, so that that's super important I do think especially if you want to be part of like a fast growing startup like you do need to just have a good work ethic like it's not a normal job it's a very unique job um and i think you know one thing that i think is always kind of one thing that i am kind of proud of is i, I do think i'm good and my co-founders are good at um being able to listen to people and change our minds if we find that there's new data or new insights that we didn't know before we don't always think we have the right answer so being able to um, have a team that you respect and that you don't pull rank on and that if they bring something to you, you think it's like as valid as something you might have brought is, uh, I think, necessary as you scale. That, that's something interesting I picked up on there is um, you mentioned pulling rank. Um, now, mm -hmm. everyone has their own leadership style. Uh, would mm -hmm. you say yours is more like uh, hands on digging in or are you more like willing to delegate? Um, a little bit of both. I think I really like to be aware of what's going on and I definitely have uh an instinct which I probably could be a little bit better about of just like jumping into the data or, or going and trying to understand something myself um, just because I like being close to the customers and close to the problem and because you know that's what I used to do when there wasn't a big team so but that being said I do think that uh, I really do try to allow my team to make their own decisions and to uh, not micromanage although I do like to definitely understand uh, what's happening. Yeah, and I think there's definitely like a, a good nuance to be found between like mm -hmm. hands on a micro manager. Yeah. Um, mo most of the people that we are lucky enough to talk to on the firesides, they found that balance. So that's yeah. always good to see. But they're, um, always, they're always kind of recalibrating because as the team grows, it's, you know, the job changes so often. Absolutely. That was actually going to be my very next question. You, you totally read my mind. Um, how do you, how do you, well, do you have to consciously adapt your leadership style as the team grows or is it something that just sort of happens naturally? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, one thing is just, you know, at a very like basic level when there's 10 people on the team, like I talked with everybody probably almost at least once a week, some people more at the least, maybe like once every two weeks, right? So um, you didn't need to have as much structure with your communication and you also didn't need to be as deliberate with communication because you just had a stronger relationship with everybody on the team because you're talking with them more. Now that we're over 70 people, um, there's different layers and there's just, you know, just it's mathematically impossible for me to talk to everybody that much. So um, sometimes that means, hey, stuff won't happen naturally. You need to build in structures. You need to build in times where you communicate this. And then also sometimes, you know, when you're talking with people, you need to realize I might not talk to this person again for a few weeks. So let's make sure that um, we're careful. I'm careful with what I say or that we're, you know, we're deliberate with what we're saying. Um, so that's been one thing that, uh, you know, when you're first starting, you don't think you need the change. You're like, okay, I'm just going to be natural. This is who I am. And then as you, as the company gets bigger, you just need to think a lot more about that structure and the, that communication cadence. And I guess another thing that tends to happen a lot when companies start getting bigger is that you have to start thinking more consciously about building the culture. Because when you've got, like you said, when you've got a room of 10 people, the culture is the chemistry that exists between those 10 yeah. people and you don't really need to work at it too hard. Um, yeah. So is that something that you're having to consciously build and really think about is like the culture of your company and how do you go about that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially because we're a fully remote company and have always been fully remote, we've always had to be a little bit more deliberate about building time for interpersonal relationships uh, which I think is very important for culture because you're just going to feel a lot more comfortable asking people questions, you know, um, just digging in, pinging people when you're not sure what's going on. Um, so being able to build that comfort, it just wasn't going to happen naturally because we're fully remote. So, um, so we have a lot of different uh, kind of structured meetings that are almost, they're structured, unstructured meetings where there are times on the calendar where people can just hang out, don't need to talk about work. And then we also have structured meetings for, hey, this is when we share our OKRs. This is like a AMA. This is um, a time where we show what we've released in the product recently. So you have to build in all of these structures so that people are um, feel close and connected uh, over time. 
Yeah, especially in a remote setting, it always reminds me of like going back to university when uh -huh. you arrive in your first two weeks and you don't know anyone and it's just a bit chaotic. So you have to like organize events to get to know everyone. It is like kind of structured, organized fun just to be mm -hmm. able to like meet face to face. So that's well, that's what it always reminds me of. I don't know if that yeah, was ever. No. I think that's one hundred percent right. That like, uh, yeah, that, that's like a really good analogy. Yeah, the the organized fun that we all started appreciating much more after after the pandemic. Um, so if you had to, oh, leadership's a big topic and it's difficult to mm -hmm. summarize. Um, but what would you say is the main characteristic that really makes for a great leader? Yeah, um, and I, and I will say like I think there are many different types of good leaders, right? And I think you know some are in vogue while others are out of vogue. I think like some of the best leaders of all time probably you know we, we would frown on the way they were leaders and that's just you know not the type of leader i am but you know i think we should acknowledge that there's different types of leadership but for me i think some of like the marks of a good leader are um you know being able to change their mind being able to admit when they were wrong um being able to you know there are tough decisions that need to be made um being able to make kind of trade-offs between long term and short term and it's it's not always you want to choose the long term um but you but sometimes you do and you need to figure out that right trade-off. Um, and I think kind of like the marks of it are, you know, you have a team that's retentive and high performing and, and feels independent and feels empowered uh, to take bets and to make decisions themselves. Um, so I, I think those are like the main marks, like trying to find that balance between pushing forward the team, but also letting the team uh, go out and like pull you forward. Absolutely. And is, are there any are there any skills or characteristics that you're looking to get better at or any areas of leadership that you would personally like to improve on? Yeah. Um, once again, I think like communication is constantly, you know, something you can never be great at. And I think as the company gets bigger, figuring out where to delegate exactly and where not to delegate. Um, the, those are the two that you're kind of constantly doing as you get uh, as the company gets larger. And then I think another thing um, as like a leader of a growing company that you don't think of as much when it's smaller is more organizational design. So like how are the departments organized, how do they interact with each other? Um, and what, what are the structures for that is something that, um, you know, now that we're at this stage, I'm starting to try to read more about and learn a little bit more about. Mm -hmm. um, we've actually sort of on that topic, we've got an interesting question from Adam on LinkedIn who wants to know, uh, he says, uh, interested to understand how you decided which roles to hire for as you scaled from 10 to 70. Obviously, you don't have the budget to hire every role under the sun. So how do you prioritize which roles to hire for? Yeah, I think uh, one kind of like sideways to answer this question is th the one thing you notice is that the roles self-reinforce each other. So a lot of it is balance because let's say you hire like five people, then you also need someone like in HR or if you have uh, more product managers than you need more data scientists or user researchers so they can be better at their job. And you start to realize, oh, like every time I hire this person, what pressure does it do on the other departments that help support that person or that that person's supposed to support? Um, so it's very easy to, to get into the cycle where the more you hire, you need to keep hiring more people. Um, but, you, but at the end of the day, you have to have a strategy, right? You have to figure out okay, like this is our goals. Um, so therefore we need this many salespeople to hit that. Therefore we need this many leads. So then you need a marketing team of this size. And then, you know, on the product side, okay, we have this many engineers. So therefore we need this many PMs, this many designers. Um, and, and you need to figure out how they all interact. So um, that's the most probably like important thing I've learned as I scale the team is that the way to think about it is not to think like, oh, do I hire this department or this department? It's okay. Hiring this person, what does that do to the whole ecosystem and to the whole company? It's interesting that you said you sort of base it on the goals that you want to achieve. Because mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes when uh, I've spoken to hiring managers in the past mm -hmm. who say that their um, their C suite is focused on output rather than outcomes, mm -hmm. so they say we want to do this, this, and this, so we need to hire this these people to do it mm -hmm. without really thinking, okay, but what's that going to achieve? Like we need to base it on the outcome. So it's just something interesting that I. Picked up on. And that, that's idealized. I don't want to pretend that I'm perfect at that. Like sometimes it's hard to say this person leads to this, but at least that's like a framework you can try to, to lay back on. But sometimes you do have to go with your intuition or with what your VPs tell you they need. Um, so it's definitely not perfect. Of course. Well, it, everyone's got their own learning curves for sure. Yeah. 
definitely. Um, so what are some of the things that you're the most interested in learning about these days? It doesn't have to be related to leadership. Like what are some of the things that most interest you? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm always interested in just seeing like macro trends in tech and startups and, um, you know, what that might mean for our company, but also just the space in general. And then um, from a more like, hey, this is how I can become a better leader. It is more of that organizational design. Um, and, you know, part of that's learning through reading, a lot of that's learning through talking to peers or talking to other uh, founders at later stage startups to see how they do it. So um, having that peer group has been very useful. Mm -hmm. And uh, just another question, so, so sort of circling back to hiring. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure how involved you are in the hiring process now that you're starting to scale a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but when you were interviewing people to come and join you in the early days, what mm -hmm. were some of the characteristics that you looked for just in general from the people you were bringing on to the team? Yeah, I mean, definitely at a startup, you need like um, people who are like organized and can manage uh, multiple priorities at once. Um, and that also are like self starters. Um, and then it obviously depends on the role. There's like other skills you look for, but um, people who have shown like initiative either in previous roles or, or in life outside of roles, like they have a side project or they're, you know, curious about this one thing and spend a lot of time like learning or working on it. That always like shines to me like, oh, that's going to be a great member of the team because they've shown that they uh, can like prioritize things and also like be a self-starter. They don't need someone to tell them uh, what to do. Yeah, I guess in startups, you need sort of almost as many entrepreneurs in the room as possible when you yeah. build something like that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So um, when and when you're building your teams, how much did you have to consider like the small thing? Well, not the small things, but the softer things like people's personalities, um, how people would sort of like mesh together the culture. Was, was that mm -hmm. ever a, con a consideration or was it more about the resume, their experience, like how much, how did you find the balance between those two things? Yeah, I mean, the, the, there is this concept of like, you know, we want culture ads, not culture fit. So you don't want to just have like everyone who's like around a room looking at each other, but there are some things that you try to kind of stay away from, right? You don't want people who seem like um, overly critical or negative about other people that they're working with or who, who just, um, or, you know, who, who don't seem like they have some of those positive traits I mentioned previously. So, like, there is definitely a reason to have kind of these more, like, behavioral soft-skilled interviews, uh, for sure. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you're, like, taking away the biases that you have so that you're kind of, like, continuing to expand the team and the diversity of the team. But, um, but it is important to make sure that, you know, you're not going to have someone who is, you know, kind of continuously bringing down morale uh, across the team. I remember we we asked that same question of I think it was uh, Yariv Adan I think from Google maybe I'm wrong mm -hmm. um, and when we asked him that question he just said oh I have a very strong no jerks policy yeah it was the fantastic answer it doesn't get it doesn't get better than that um, so obviously yes yeah, you've you've not just scaled your company but you've also scaled as a leader in your career um, mm -hmm. how what what were some of the major changes for you as you moved more into a position of authority, like as a CEO and a co-founder? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love for you to have this same interview with people on my team to see if it matches. Uh, but, but for me, um, you know, definitely delegating more, right? When it's just you and the co-founders, you know, I'm doing every sale, we're doing every ops thing. My, uh, you know, my co-founder is CTO is building everything. So you have to be able to like let go of these things that, or hard to let go. And I think over, you know, the past few years, there have been things that I probably have held on to longer than I should have. Um, so, so that's been the biggest thing. And then the other thing is kind of like, you know, there's things that happen naturally when you're small and you need to, you need to kind of be always looking ahead to see like, are we taking this for granted? And what can we do to make sure that uh, we don't wait too long to fix it? You want to get ahead of those problems over time. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we're coming up to our last few minutes now, so I just want to do a little bit more of a deep dive into user research and user interviews. Um, mm -hmm. If there's a company that somehow has managed to get by so far without doing much user research and they're suddenly realizing, oh, my God, there's this huge thing that we just haven't been doing enough of. How would you how would you suggest that they start from zero with their user research, maybe even with your tools? Yeah, um, so I think our tools specifically are like, they're very self-serve. They're made for people to just come in and launch without a ton of background. So 
we just try to really focus on finding the right user for you really fast. Um, so easy to use. People definitely use us just for single projects initially all the time um, and, and low commitment. Um, but I think the number one thing I, I would do if I'm trying, if I realize, hey, we're not doing enough user research at the team is to really um, think through, you know, assuming given the, the audience here, assuming we're talking about product teams, like really try to like map out what the product process is. Um, like, hey, this is when we set goals. This is when we you know, choose what we're building. Like, I, I don't know what the iteration process is. Different companies have different ways. Um, but if you really like map out that process, I think you'll find times where, hey, a decision is made here, a decision is made here, a decision is made here. And like, this is the type of decision where um, analytics would be super useful. Or this is a type of decision where, hey, we probably should talk to somebody. And then you can kind of end up putting that research into your process. You want it to feel a lot more natural. Um, and you also want research to uh, feel a lot smaller. You don't want it to be like a very big, scary project that you have to plan for two months and it's going to cost, you know, thousands of dollars. You want to just be like, hey, at the end of the day, research is asking someone a question and this is a time where I'll have a question. I'm just going to do it very quick uh, with, with, a, it, you know, not spend that much money, not spend that much time. And then you start building up that muscle. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's what I recommend. Start slow and build build your way up for sure. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I'm watching the minutes tick away. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I just have one last question before I'll let you get back to your uh, your very busy day. I imagine. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self to help you go further, be more successful, be a better leader, all that good stuff? Yeah, I think um, one find a peer group. Uh, the more peers you can talk with or bounce questions off the better. I found that I get, you know, me personally, like peers are sometimes more helpful than mentors. Um, so finding a peer group has been really important. And then, you know, thinking bigger, I think like a lot of people kind of underestimated, how, underestimate how big their companies could be at the beginning. And I think like really trying to like think about that vision and make sure that then the small decisions you're making early on are pointing in the right uh, direction. Um, and then I, I think I saw a quote that was like, most decisions should be made faster, but the biggest decision should be made slower. So trying to think like, hey, is this a decision where I really need to get to like full consensus and do a lot of research or is like, does it not matter that much? And let's just like really focus on moving or on the flip side, is this like a very large decision and let's take our time with it. So um, generally, I would say like trying to make decisions faster. Absolutely fantastic advice. I hope you all wrote that down, you at home. <laughs> Great advice to take away. Uh, so that was my very last question. Uh, Basil, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have you. Awesome. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for joining and uh, enjoy the rest of your mornings, afternoons, evenings, night times, wherever you are. And we will see you in the next fireside chat. Bye.